Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. It's good to be in the house of the Lord and sing praises. It's one thing that boy don't have on me. He can't sing. (laughs) I can't either, but I don't let that hold me back. (laughs) Good to have you in the house this morning. We welcome you if you're visiting. If it's your first time or first time in a long time, we're glad you're here. We hope you've already been welcomed. We pray that today will be a changing day in your life. Amen? Amen. Every day we pray that it's a changing day in your life. Uh, We often do things on specific days that are very important to us. This happens to be the weekend that we are recognizing our Veterans and Veterans Day weekend. More than just a three-day weekend, it's something special to us. I think it, it means more to us than it, it means, should mean more to us than it does. But if you are here this morning and you happen to be a veteran of any kind, of any branch, in any service, could we honor you this morning? Would you mind just standing on your feet and let us just say thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your service. It matters to us. Mark, I didn't know you were a veteran. Yeah. What, sir, what, what area? God bless your heart. I war. Well, <laughs> we start a war in here. I was, I was watching uh, Family Feud the other night, and they said that one of the questions was, which branch of the service has the best looking people? <laughs> and the, you know what they said? You'll like this. They said Marines. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about all that. (laughs) The Marine Corps' birthday. Today? Well, happy birthday. God bless him. I I learn more stuff every day. Praise the Lord. So what a great day. It's a great day for our nation. I think it's a great season for our nation. I think think it's a good thing for everybody. Let's move forward in a healing way. Amen? Amen. Move forward in a healing way. I think that that we can just just take moments like this and just make the most of them. And I pray that to God that we will as a nation that we'll do that. We'll make the most of this moment uh, and step forward into whatever future is coming our way. Either way, Jesus Christ is Lord. God is on his throne. So we're, we're handled every way. But when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. And let's just pray that we continue to see that happening. Ladies, I think there's a fellowship this Thursday night, if I'm correct, at 6.30 p.m. in the event room over there. Don't want to miss that. So if you're a lady and you'd like to go, or if you identify as one, you'd like to. Oh, Jared's going to get you. Y'all can tell I haven't preached in a while. Feel a little spicy. What you do, first of all, is get the crowd mad at you, and then, then you can kind of win them back over. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. Uh, Jared, Pastor Jared is out. He is in uh, Georgia enjoying a weekend. I don't know if they're watching or not. I hope to God they're not. Uh, they are. <laughs> Turn it off and go play. Uh, but w- they deserved uh, some time off, and, and I, I'm always happy to get a chance to be his backup quarterback. So I'm going to take a swing for the fences this morning. Second uh, Kings chapter 6. Uh, this week sometime, if you will, in your own time of reflection, take the time to read the first five chapters of the book of Second Kings. Because in those first five chapters, more happens in just those few chapters than has happened in my entire lifetime. Uh, you see things just that you, you will not see in anywhere else. Chapter 1 picks up after the battle between Elijah and the false prophets on Mount Carmel. And, and, and if that wasn't enough, an ungodly king, Ahaziah, sends messengers to come Command that Elijah the prophet show up at the king's castle. And Elijah calls fire down from heaven and burns up a hundred of them. Fifty here, fifty there. And the third fifty that comes up goes, hey, ho, ho. (laughs) 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 Kind of like I would do. Like, (laughs) I ain't going out there. Uh, Chapter 2 finds Elijah the prophet being taken up by a a whirlwind into heaven on a chariot of fire. Just received by God to heaven without having to taste of death. What an amazing chapter. Chapter 3 begins the alliance between the newly anointed prophet Elisha and King Jehoshaphat, which became a remarkable alliance between those two. Chapter 4 is the record of the beginning of the miracles of Elisha. And as you know, 
He asked Elijah for a double portion of his anointing. And, and as we know, looking at the Bible, he did exactly twice the miracles that Elijah did. So the life of Elisha was just boiled in miracles. You see that it started with the widow's oil. He restored the oil for the widow, the, the resurrection of the Shunammite's son who had passed away and died. And then a Jesus-like multiplication of, of food for people to eat, chapter 5 is the healing of Naaman the leper uh, who came with leprosy and told him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times and that whole story as it played out. And then the, the greed of a Gehazi who, who wanted something in return and was stricken with leprosy. So that's why I say in the first five chapters, there's so much more that just happens there. But chapter six is our text for the day. Uh, and I know you've been standing for a minute, but would you please stand in honor of the reading of God's word starting in 2 Kings chapter six. And the eighth verse. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. Funny how things don't change. <laughs> and he consulted with his servants saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God, that is Elisha, sent to the king of Israel saying, Beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down there. Insight into your enemy's actions is priceless. I'm going there this morning. Verse 10, then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. Thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. <laughs> Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, PC version, which one of you guys is ratting us out? <laughs> That's how I would have said it. Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Verse 12, and one of his servants said, no, none, my Lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> Have mercy. So he said, go and see where he is that I might send and get him. And it was told him saying, surely he is in Dothan. Dothan, by the way, is where Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. Therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, do you all remember this story? Yes. There was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots, and his servant said to him, O oh Lord, alas, my master, what shall we do? That instant rise of the spirit of fear. Verse 16, so he answered, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And that's good. But this is a little better. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, if you can, y'all can sit down. You're going to be here a minute. I know y'all are not used to long sermons, so I'll try to do my best. <laughs> Several weeks ago, I had an experience that was pretty rare for me, but it affected me so much that it became the basis for this word this morning. Kathy and I were in North Carolina, and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning when I woke up from a dead sleep at 3 o'clock in the morning. Now, most of you probably wouldn't know this about me, so here it comes. Anyone who knows me well knows that nothing steals my sleep. I'm asleep right now. Nothing steals my sleep. I won't let it happen. Years ago, somebody write this down. I stumbled into a revelation of Psalms chapter 4 and verse 8 where the Bible says, I will lie down in peace and sleep, and you, O Lord, will protect me. So I don't, I don't, I don't do that. Some of y'all that, you know, stay up all night worrying about stuff, uh-uh. I don't do that. I don't fret. I don't worry. I, how do you do it? I just told you. I got a revelation. I don't toss and turn. If I do wake up, I pray, and I go right back to sleep. That's what let me know that this was more than just a little thing. This was more than just me waking up. I was in a dead, dead sleep, and I woke up with so much stuff just swirling around in my mind. Now, I know that y'all won't be able to relate to that, so just use your imagination. <laughs> Stir it up a little bit in here. Um, 
so much in my mind that I can't even that I can't even tell you how it just happened. Like just a flood of things just came running at me in my mind at one time. Now, thankfully, since I'm old as I am, this isn't my first battle. So I immediately recognized what this was. This was something. This was something more than just I woke up. This was a spiritual thing. This is a sp- don't think that it doesn't happen, y'all. This was a spiritual thing. It was happening in the middle of the night. It was happening to me. Uh, and so I immediately obeyed the word. The word of God says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Listen, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I immediately did that. And when I did that, it settled. But this word jumped in my spirit. And so I knew, okay, devil, you tried that, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to give this to the people and let them walk with it. Uh, this morning, I want to press this thought into your life. Maybe you're going to need it. Maybe you won't, but you might at some point in your future. The thought that I had that I want to press into your life is this, based on these verses we just read. Just because I don't see it. I'm going to hang with that for a little while. You need it more than you think you do. Just because I don't see it. Father, have us this morning in a posture that we can hear what you have to say to us this morning. Let everything that we do from this moment on bring you glory, bring revelation here, open the eyes of our understanding. God, let us hear what you brought us here this morning to hear. And they said together, Amen. one of the most common words for us as believers is the word faith. We are all in our own way workingly familiar with it, but by definition, faith means Trust and confidence in God and in his promises. When you strip it all down, that's what it means. It is, it is being able to trust God, not because you have to, but because of the reality that in your life, he has already shown himself over and over again to be true and to be trustworthy. When you say, I have faith, what you're saying is, I believe. It's that simple. I am persuaded. I believe. I believe what? Well, I believe that God is real. I believe that this is true. I believe that God is able. I believe that he is faithful. I believe that his word is true and his promises are true. Now, we live long enough now to know this, and hopefully you do as well, but that is how God wants us to live. That's how he wants us to live. Four times it is recorded in your Bible, the just shall live by faith. Four times. When, when the Word of God repeats something that many times, then it, it's, it's significant to us. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. So many folks are running around trying to figure out ways to make God smile, make God happy. There it is. Without faith it is impossible to please God. And then the writer of the book of Hebrews goes on to list, to devote an entire chapter to the exploits of the men and women of faith. Who through faith, according to the word, uh, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lying, raised the dead back to life again. They did all of these things. If you've ever read Hebrews 11, you see it one right after another. Now, as a child who grew up in church, so many times when I read through those names, I just thought they were really something spectacular. I don't know if you saw it this way, but that's how I, through a child's eyes, saw it. I, I saw that... They were not like me. They were not like me. They were not like me at all. I mean, it was, they had to be something. I mean, they, they did all of these things by faith in God, and, and, and I'm, I'm not necessarily like that. And so even though all of that is exciting, it always felt like it was just out of my reach. It was just something that, that they did, but, you know, it's nice to read and nice to see it. Until one day when I was reading through the book of James, and I found James chapter 5 and verse 17. In James 5, 17, it it records this about Elijah. It says, he was a man just like we are. (laughs) And I went, "Uh uh-oh. It became, it became revelation to me. He is a man like me. He is a man like me. He's not different. He's not special. He's a man just like I am. And that changed everything for me. And to this very day, to to this moment, when I read their stories looking through that lens, I don't see superiority. I don't see superhumans. I see humanity. 
I see somebody, come on, just like me. He was just like me. And I don't know when or how we bought into this, but sometimes when you hear people talking about faith or fear, it, they sometimes present it to you as if it is an either-or proposition. You either have faith or you don't. You are either in fear or you are not. But what it is really, and I think I've found it out to be true, is that it is a complex mixture of both of those things that are fighting for victory in that moment of your testing. So when, when you are having a test in your life and you feel that little tinge of fear, that doesn't mean you are a failure. That just means you are human. I'm going to preach before I get out of here this morning. That is humanity. I am not a machine. I will preach this until I'm done because we are all flesh. There will be times in your life when you have doubts and you are afraid. Oh, I'm going to walk by faith. And then the next day, you get a phone call and you freak out about it. And so you think this faith stuff doesn't work. That's not true. There will be times when you have fears and you have doubts. Even the Apostle Paul, thank God, said, without were fightings, but within were fears. I was on the outside telling them, I got this, I got this. But inside, I was afraid. I find it to be true in my own self that many times I am full of questions. Don't judge me. Full of doubt, full of fear, full of unbelief, living in the, the, the balance of being commanded to live by faith, but at times so shaken by what I'm facing or being asked to do that I demonstrate my doubt by asking God to prove something to me one more time. I'm sure you already know this, but for the sake of the sermon, I'm going to say it, that sometimes living and walking by faith makes no sense at all. <laughs> Mm, dear God, help us. Because everything that you can see and everything that you can hear is telling you this, but your faith is telling you that. And so one of the tendencies, come on, that we all have is to look for some kind of an evidence or sign or proof that we are at least going in the right direction or that I have not just completely lost my flipping mind. Yes. I have, have I just lost my mind? Hey, let's buy some land. You've lost your mind. Memory lane. I'm old enough now. I got memories. <laughs> 25 years ago, I preached a sermon over on Kings Estate Road that got me in trouble. People got mad at me. I don't mean just a little, oh, it hurt my feelings. No, they got mad at me. I preached a sermon called, Sometimes All I Have is a Maybe. Yep. You would have thought I slapped the Pope. <laughs> People wrote me letters. People made appointments, came to my office. We didn't have email. They came to my office. You obviously don't understand what faith is. Maybe you don't get it, but you're so wrong. I said, sometimes all I have to go on is a maybe. Even though what I said was straight out of the word of God, y'all. Look it up. 1 Samuel chapter 14. When Jonathan was facing an enemy, he said, who knows? Maybe God will work with us. I'm going with that. But if you need more, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood in front of the king and said, God can do it, God will do it, but if he don't. <laughs> maybe he will, maybe he won't. I can identify with that. Maybe not you, but I can identify with someone who stands up and says, I'm just being honest right now. I'm trying to get my heart back to a posture where I can trust God again. I'm just trying to get there, man. I'm working on it. All of which brings me back to this original thought that sometimes as we are doing our best to follow him, there are things that we don't see. Right. Second Kings is one of those moments. Transparency. As a child, I grew up afraid of almost everything. The spirit of fear. Your verse this morning, that just God has not given us a spirit of fear, power, love, and a sound mind. When I was a child, I was terrified of everything. I don't know why. I grew up in a safe home. I never had any trauma. I was just, I was afraid of everything. Cats, bats, rats, <laughs> snakes, spiders, dark. You, you, you put me in a dark room, I'm freaking out. I was just afraid of everything. Until one day in Sunday school, thank God for Sunday school teachers, our Sunday school teacher taught on this, and this, this story changed my life forever in this moment. Syria and Israel were at war. And every time the king of Syria would hatch a plan to go somewhere and do something, the Spirit of God would tell Elisha what was going to happen. 
The spirit of Elisha, the uh, prophet Elisha would tell the king of Israel what was going to happen and where they were going to be. And so every time he tried to do something, oh my God, let the people of God get some revelation. (laughs) Just chill for a minute and just soak that in. That at any moment, God knows every plan being formed against you. You say, oh, well, there's no plan being formed against me. You are so mistaken. (laughs) Right now, there are plans coming at you. (laughs) Your phone's going to be ringing this week. That at any moment, God knows every story, every lie, every alliance, every whisper. He knows this, not only the plans that he has for you, but he also knows the plans that the enemy has for you that are coming up this week that you don't know anything about. Somebody gets a revelation. Somebody is scheming against you at work. And you don't think they are. Oh, that's my best friend. Your best friend would shove your head into the boiling oil if they could. There's somebody at work right now that don't like you, that wants your place, that wants your spot. There's somebody right now that don't like you, that wants your man. Oh, you ain't saying nothing. You notice Kathy ain't said nothing. She's like, mm, that's got it. Where you at? Take a number. Get you can have that. Your, your best friend, you, your best friend is gossiping with you on the phone. And you feel so good about that, but you don't realize that the moment they hang up with you, they're going to call somebody else and talk about you to them. Because if they'll talk with you, they'll talk about you. God knows. So, so this is a little insert right there. So the king of Syria, the king of Syria says, well, where is this fool at? He said, he's in Dothan. So the king sends not just a few soldiers. Did y'all read that? He sends an army. <laughs> Let the people of God get some revelation. Why do they send an army against one guy? Because you have a bad God. Why did they put a stone on a dead man's tomb? You see the same thing. The army gets in place, and I've always loved this, that the following morning when the servant walks out to go go to Starbucks, he walks outside, and there they are. There's an army. They are wrapped around the hills. And he immediately says, runs back inside and says, what are we going to do? And Elisha says, do not be afraid. Verse 16, do not be afraid, for there are more on our side than there are on their side. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes. Listen to me because we're going to go there. The Bible says, and when he looked up. If this was Jared, y'all would know we're getting ready to do something. (laughs) Said when he looked up. When he looked up. When he looked. When he looked. See, I love that when he does that. When he looked up. Somebody needs to hear this, that you're finding all the wrong things because you are looking in all the wrong places. You're not looking up. See You're looking in the wrong places. Depression wants you to look down. You get into a depressed state and you start looking down at the ground. Fear wants you to look around. Fear wants you to look and see who can help me, what can turn this around. Pride wants you to look inside. Oh, I can fix this if I can just get my hands on it. Failure wants you to look down. Part of your maturing process is when you finally learn where you're supposed to be looking. The Bible says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from where my help comes from. You've got to learn how to lift up your eyes and look for God in every situation. The Bible says that when he looked, when he looked, he saw that the mountains were filled with chariots of fire right behind my enemies. Sometimes don't you ever feel sorry for your enemies? No. (laughs) I need to preach a little bit more. (laughs) You should have said yes so it would sound religious and right. But you're probably right. I don't feel sorry for them. They probably deserve what they're finna get. Said they were circled and surrounded. It happens so many times in life when we start to live by sight and faith that in light of our circumstances rooted in our carnality, we start counting and we start calculating. We start trying to figure it out. What do I have? What do I have left? How much do I have? How many do I have? Do I have enough? 
Rooted in our carnality, we start trying to count and we start trying to calculate how we can figure this situation out. Who is with me? Ah, who is against me? Can I make it? Can I take it? Am I strong enough? Am I able? Am I going to be able to make that? And when we do that, we can easily forget. I'm about to say something that y'all should amen. We easily forget that none of that matters. Stop counting. Stop calculating. Stop trying to figure it out. What do I got? Who's with me? How's this going to work? What do I got to do? Who do I need to talk to? What do I got to... How am I going to get that money? It doesn't matter if you've got one and they've got a thousand, you're still winning. It doesn't matter who is against you. All that matters is that God is for you. When we start trying to figure it out, I'm trying to help somebody, we start letting our flesh interrupt our faith. And then we talk ourselves right out of believing God. Have you ever talked yourself right out of believing God? Don't you think God's just sitting up there in heaven going, are you serious? Don't act like you don't do that as a parent when your kid does something stupid. God, we start looking at the giants and stop looking at the greatness of God. You don't need to be looking at your giants. You just need to be looking at the greatness of God. Stare into his eyes. And you'll see the greatness of God bigger than your giants. We start, we stop thinking like giant killers and we start thinking like grasshoppers. Too many believers sitting in churches this morning thinking like grasshoppers. You think you're smaller than everybody else. You forget that even in a lion's den. <laughs> I know what I'm going to say, so I'm excited about it. You forget that even in a lion's den, there is only one king. And his name ain't Simba. His name is Jesus. Even in my lion's den, there's only one king. And it ain't me. On that night a few weeks ago in North Carolina, I woke up like that. Maybe you can relate. I was instantly overwhelmed. I don't get overwhelmed. I was instantly overwhelmed by thoughts and feelings and emotions and circumstances and questions and what ifs. Let me just let me just insert something here, and because I got to, it's an old-fashioned Pentecostal shout out. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Where y'all Pentecostals at? Thank. God for the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. At altar this morning, if you don't, if you're not filled up and beyond with the power of the Holy Spirit, that's your prayer. You need to pray, God, fill me up today. I need you. Thank God Almighty for the power of the Holy Spirit in us. We need the Spirit of God in our lives because for a moment I forgot. I forgot everything that I was supposed to be remembering, and He quickly reminded me. Now watch this. And, 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 and not only this, but after that, I got the victory over that. I woke up the next morning feeling, woo. You know, that little woo that you get when you wake up the next morning. But the next few days, I felt supernatural. Like, where's the devil at? Is there happen to be one around here? Stepping into places just looking for a devil because I just, it was something supernatural. God reminded me, man, that's more in you than you know that there's in you. I started looking for devils to fight. And then after that, I started, something else started happening. I started getting words and confirmations one after another that everything that I was overwhelmed by was a complete lie. You know the devil is a liar. So when he's starting to talk to you, everything that he's saying is a lie. You start feeling that, you start thinking that, oh, it's, it's nothing, it's a lie. I got back here to St. Augustine, and I'm still talking about this. And so if you, if it was you, God bless your heart. Someone in this church had given an offering, dropped it into the box back there, did not put their name on it. It was significant. It was quite a bit of, of, of something. And they wrote on the envelope, God is moving. Amen. Now, I don't know who you are, but that became an anthem in my life. I'm still talking about it. God is moving. God is moving, and he's not moving out. So I came here today with this just this little thing here to remind you that just because you have eyes doesn't mean that you can see. And what you do see may not mean anything. And just because you can't see something doesn't mean that it isn't there. 
That's a mouthful right there, y'all. Just because you have eyes don't mean that you're seeing anything. Just because you're seeing something doesn't mean anything. And just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it isn't there. Elisha said, open his eyes. What a blessing to be able to see what is there when you did not see it just a moment ago. See, nothing had changed. There was enemies all around him, but right behind those enemies, the, uh, the army was already there. The chariots of fire were already there, but he didn't see that I came today to pray that prayer of Elisha over us. Amen. Woo, open our eyes. Amen. I'm going to pray that this morning in a world characterized by blindness. Amen. Open my eyes and remind me that even though I may not see it, doesn't mean that all around me there is not the provision and the protection of God. Yes. Open my eyes to see that those who are with me are more than those who are against me. Yes. Somebody say amen. You need that more than you think that you do. Sometimes it feels like exactly the opposite. We've been told for at least 20 years, you Christian, you Jesus people, you know you are the minority. You know that America is a post-Christian nation now. That, that, that every other group is powerful, more powerful than you are. You're just an extreme, you're just radical, that everyone else is going this direction and y'all insist on going that direction. Stay still, sit still, sit in your little buildings and keep your mouth shut. Your day is over, we'll take it from here. Ah, you're in the wrong route. You're in the wrong route. You're in the wrong route. You'll take what? You'll take what? Amen. Amen. Don't stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Let's not get crazy. Don't make people mad. I'll get kicked off of TikTok. You'll take what from here? Because every stupid thing that the world has taken over has gone to. Everything woke goes to a really bad place. Indoctrinating children. You know, your schools, and God bless the godly teachers, but in schools, many ways, what they're getting is nothing but indoctrination. You'll take it from here, doing what? Convincing children that their sexuality is wrong? That a four-year-old has the sense enough to recognize what they are or are not, that I'm a boy or I'm a girl or whatever. Day after election day, there was a father. There was a father on a talk show demonstrating his ignorance. He said, my 13-year-old daughter has been up all night long crying that because of this election, she cannot get an abortion. <laughs> father, sir, you have failed miserably as a parent. Maybe she shouldn't be worrying about an abortion. Maybe you should be talking to her about abstinence. And chasteness and purity in her life. That night and... Okay, back to the sermon. <laughs> that night in North Carolina, I realized that in my own life, at that moment, all I was seeing was enemies. All I was seeing was issues. Troubles. Maybe you can relate. Problems. Wake up in the middle of the night and all you can see is problems. Enemies. Disappointment. The Holy Spirit reminded me. And I'm reminding you. Get your head right. Get your heart right. Stir up your faith and start seeing the move of God. Because just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. I'm going to sing. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm in a new thing. I'm in a new mindset. Even though I'm, I'm still the same guy, I, I'm living my life aggressively looking for what God is doing. I'm trying to get y'all to come there with me. I'm aggressively looking to see what God is doing, not what the devil is doing. I don't care two shakes about what the devil is doing. I want to know what God is doing. And what I see now is just because I don't see it doesn't mean that prodigals are not returning to their relationship with Jesus because they are. Y'all know I'm right. I'm seeing it more and more that prodigal sons and daughters who gave you the finger and walked away from your faith, they're coming back in record numbers right now. They want to get back to Jesus. They're coming home. They're coming home. Just because I don't see it. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that God is not fighting for me and my prayers are not prevailing. The enemy can tell you you're going to lose this one, but just because I don't see it doesn't mean that God's not fighting for me. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that drug addicts and alcoholics are not being set free because they are. In record numbers, we're seeing this. 
In fact, alcohol sales are beginning to dip, and those people who run those companies are getting a little bit nervous and wish y'all would shut up. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that heaven is not real. Where y'all at? I believe that there are streets of gold, gates of pearl, and walls of jasper. I believe that he paves the streets with gold. I believe that my family is there. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that heaven is not real. Don't let the devil talk you out of it. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that hell's not real. I expected just as much of a shout about that. Hell is real. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that judgment is not real. You may get by with it for a little while. If I was Jared, y'all would have said, "Uh uh-huh. You may get by with it for a little while, but God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. Judgment is real. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that revival isn't happening. Because it is. Have y'all seen more and more of these stories at college campuses and schools that it's just happening? Entire football teams, college football teams are stopping practice to go and baptize people who give their life to the Lord. It's happening just because I don't see it doesn't mean it. See, the world's got your head turned in the wrong direction. You're looking at all the wrong things. You think that the world's gone to hell. It has not. It's leaning back toward heaven. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that the favor of God is not all over my life. You think I've got more enemies than I do God. No, you don't. God's favor is all over you. Just because I don't see victory happening all the time doesn't mean that I'm losing. (laughs) When all I see is the battle... You see my victory. Somebody needs to sing that. In the spirit, by faith. I see lost souls turning back to Jesus in record numbers. I see it because I'm looking for it. I see revival and restoration and deliverance happening all the time. I'm seeing lives changed, victories happening, souls are being won. I'm seeing with my own eyes at 62 years old, dry bones are waking up. Have you felt it in the church? Dry bones are waking up. They're starting to stir and come back to life again. I'm starting to see believers becoming bolder again. Got to see more of that. We got to stop cowering in front of the culture and dare to take a stand. Oh, they'll cancel me. Cancel away. You cannot cancel what God has confirmed. You can't do it. Believers are becoming bolder. Y'all. Ah. I went to see Frank in the hospital the other day. Y'all know front row Frank? If you know, you know. Front row Frank. Stuck a screw in his foot and didn't say nothing. Grunt, army grunt. He just carried the screw around for a week. I don't know what he did, but he he ended up in the hospital. I went up there to visit him a couple of days ago, and I consider myself a pretty bold guy about my faith. He said, Pastor, you know what we need? I was like, oh, Jesus, what? We need some Bibles. I've already led 20 people to the Lord. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, Frank, enjoy that morphine. (laughs) Hand to the sky. Buddha's my witness. I'm standing there, and the the orderly comes to get him, and he's obviously some other kind of nationality. And, and, And Frank's laying in that bed, and he says, do you know Jesus? And the guy was like, nah, nah. And you could tell. This was a moment like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> and he said, no. Nah. He said, well, do you believe? He said, well, I, I, no, I don't, I don't. I don't believe. He said, can I pray for you? And I'm like, cool, let's do this. So Frank reaches out and takes him by the hand and starts praying. And at first it's one of those, Lord, bless the man. He needs to know Jesus. And then he says, now repeat after me. <laughs> Is he going to do that? He did it. Lord Jesus. And the guy, Lord Jesus, I need you to come into my heart. <laughs> I was like, woo, and he did it. And when they finished and he let go, he said, that's the best decision you'll ever make in your life. Let's go. That's what I'm talking about. I'm seeing. I'm seeing that. Strongholds are being broken. God's spirit, y'all, is being poured out in in ways that we haven't seen. Sons and daughters are probably, I see revival in America. And I hear God saying in my spirit, look for more. Look for more. 
I want to put some new eyes on the job. I want to put all of y'all's eyes on the job. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. God said you will search for me and you will find me when you look for me with all of your heart. Amen. One of the problems with this culture and this generation right now is that we give everything else our attention. God is still saying, look unto me. But we're giving everything else our attention. Everything in this culture is screaming for our attention. And we're responding to it by giving it away. We spend too much time staring at all the wrong things. I'm going to preach that. I'm not that old, old school guy, but I am that old school guy. We spend way too much time staring at the TV. Yeah, come on. Movies, videos, phones. Yeah. Some of y'all sitting in here right now, you've checked your phone 10 times since I've been preaching. Yeah. Newsflash, you ain't that important. <laughs> you ain't that important. Unless your name is doctor, <laughs> you ain't that important. Too much time staring at the culture. Oh, did you see what J-Lo wore? I don't give two shakes what J-Lo wore. J-Lo can't make up her mind who she's going to marry. She needs to stand up and tell me who to... Anyway. Celebrities. We are a celebrity worshiping culture. I remember when I was a kid, I was going through the checkout line one time with my dad at some supermarket, a little pick and save or something, and there was a, one of them gossip rags over there with pictures of celebrities on it, and as a kid, I knew who the celebrities were, and I said, Dad, look at there, that's so-and-so, and Dad said, I don't even know who that is, and I thought, now, how is it possible that you don't know who that is? <laughs> well, here I am looking at celebrity magazines going, I don't know who you are. I don't care who you are. I don't know who you are. Oh, did you see what so-and-so did? No. We are staring at all the wrong things. I hear God saying in my spirit, start going deeper. If you're going to be praying, pray for wisdom. If you're going to read, read the book of Proverbs. Because we're just that ignorant. We need some wisdom. We need some greater revelation. We need to go deeper. We're still... Standing on the surface, we're, 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 we're standing in mud puddles and we think that we're swimming in oceans. Right. <laughs> so stupid. We go to the doctor looking for healing when we've already been told that there is one great physician. Right. He is the healer. He is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals us. Yes, please go to the doctor and get checked out. But remember, God is the one who created you. God is the one who can heal you. We look to the government to support us. When can I get my next check? The government is not supposed to be your provider. The word of God says that God Almighty is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. We make another point, appointment with our therapist. And we have completely forgotten that he is our counselor. The word of God provides me with the counsel that I need. He is our counselor. We take another pill when he is waiting to take away our pain. Brothers, sisters, your pills don't take away your pain. Right. Amen. They just numb you. Yes, right. and so what we have right now is a culture that is numb, yeah. beyond belief. Yeah. We got five-year-olds taking antidepressants. What's wrong with us? God help us. I want to see his glory. Amen. When you sang, show us your glory. It's not just a song to me. I'm praying, God, let me live long enough to see that. To see, to be in a place where your glory just descends in a room. I think for us, the closest we get is on Saturday nights. I'm going there. Saturday night prayer, 5 o'clock. A little tiny group of us get him here and we just go after God. Through prayer. You're welcome to join us, but don't come and screw it up. <laughs> we ain't here to chit chat. Right? We ain't here to talk about what's going on in the world. We're here to pray and seek God. And last night we were sitting here and it just felt like the glory of God settled in on us. Show us your glory. I've seen church for 42 years. 
Eventually, church will wear you out. I want to see the glory of God. I've seen emotions. Ah, if you just get the crowd, ah, you can get them go ah, in the right direction. Ah. Shut up. I want to see the glory of God. I've seen hype. I know how, what hype looks like. I don't want to see no more hype. I want to see the glory of God. It, start, it starts with prayer. Ladies, if y'all will, come on. It starts with prayer. Elisha. Ladies, come on. It, it, it starts with prayer. Elisha prayed. This is not on your screens, but it is in your Bibles. If you have your Bible or a phone, look at it. Ephesians chapter 1. This is a prayer from the Apostle Paul to the Ephesians. He says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know. No. I guess God wanted you to hear that part. Help me out, brother. That you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. He was praying that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. That literally means that you would understand in a way that you currently don't understand. That you would have thoughts that are deeper than you're thinking right now. That your eyes would be enlightened, which literally means that they would shine They would brighten up and they would come to light. I'm praying that prayer for me. I'm praying that prayer for you. I came to encourage somebody today. I hope it's found its mark. That just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. So you can either stay there or you can pray this prayer. Lord, Open my eyes. Open my eyes. For every depressed person in here this morning that you will look up. and Stop letting the enemy keep you looking down. For every person that is afraid, you will stop looking around you trying to figure out what you can do, how you can get out of this mess. You will stop looking around you and for every prideful person that you will stop looking within you trying to solve it yourself. You're not God. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that God's not fighting for me. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that God's favor is not on my life. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that it's not coming. Revival, healing, victory, breakthrough, it's all there. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that strongholds are not coming off of my children and my family. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. So today, with heads bowed and hearts open, Father God, take this water and turn it into wine. Let that spirit of wisdom and revelation invade this room. Open the eyes of our understanding that in a world that is characterized by blindness, we would have eyes to see. Father, have your way today. Have your way today. Heads bowed, hearts open. For the last few weeks, you've you've seen and you've felt the presence of the Spirit of God moving in this room. Last week, Shout out to the the way that Pastor Jared just invited people to come. And and people came to find a place. The Spirit of God is at work. The Spirit of God is moving. Just because you may not see it yourself doesn't mean that he's not at work. So this morning, I pray for every depressed person. Find your way to the altar. 
for every person that's struggling with the spirit of fear in your life to find your way to the altar. To lift up your eyes. To lift up your eyes and look to him. Because I promise you that just the same as it was with Elisha, that around you, you are surrounded. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I know that I'm surrounded by the spirit of God. God is fighting for you. He is with you. Somebody who feels overwhelmed by adversaries and obstacles. The Spirit of God says this again, that those who are with you are more than those who are against you. In heaven, just in the spiritual realm, if your eyes could just be open for a moment, you would see that God has dispatched angels on your behalf. God is fighting for you. Your prodigal sons and daughters are coming home. They're coming home in Jesus' name. Find a place to pray for them this morning. Bring my sons, bring my daughters, bring my mother, bring my father back home to you, God. Spirit of God, work in this place. All across this room, somebody needs to pray, open my eyes that I might see that this addiction is killing me. This addiction is keeping me in a prison. Drug addicts and alcoholics find a place to pray. Believe him because who the sun sets free is free indeed. God is at work on your behalf. Those who are struggling at work. Oh God, I hate going to work every day because I know it's just going to be a fight. Bring that workplace to the altar this morning. God, go to work in my workplace. Go to work in my workplace in me first. Let revival come to my chicken place. Let it happen, Lord. And trust me, God can go to work in that place. All across this building, if you wouldn't mind, stand up on your feet this morning. Those of you that want to pray, come on and find a place to pray. The altar is open to you. You guys will come on and lift up your voices and worship. Our prayer this morning, and and, and I'm praying that you'll join with me. God, open my eyes that I can see what I'm not seeing right now. Adversaries seem to be so many. God, open my eyes that I can see that you are with me. Open my eyes that I can see that victory is mine. That I am not abandoned. I'm not forsaken. I'm not alone. You are with me. Open my eyes to see my sons and my daughters coming back to you, God. Open my eyes to see my marriage being restored. Open my eyes today to see healing happening in my life. God, I need this. Open my eyes, God, to see revival sweeping our nation. Open my eyes to see it. So, Father, today I pray your kingdom come, your will be done. Altars are open if you'd like to come on and find a place to pray. If you will, lift up your voice and worship this morning. Hallelujah. Altar workers, if y'all will, come on and find someone to minister to. Lay your hands on people and pray and believe God. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.